and today the phone's being held by a different kind of stabilizer, so hopefully it stabilizes. Anyway, we were at the home of Sequoia. Sequoia was a Cherokee Native American who, who invented basically the Cherokee language and alphabet as a form for them to communicate in the written word. This is a statue of him. There's some of the alphabet. He was considered a Native American scholar and pretty much a genius in his time. Um, what makes that most impressive is the Europeans who came and tried to take over the United States didn't perceive the Native Americans as intelligent in their own right. They knew they knew how to raise and take care of animals and raise and take care of farms, but they didn't think them intelligent. And this guy changed everything. But this talks about the Trail of Tears. If you remember in a different video, I mentioned the Trail of Tears and how I had followed it in a different state to see. But the Trail of Tears is where the president had ordered all the Native Americans from other states to be transported up here to Oklahoma. And Oklahoma became Indian territory. I have a picture of this too. So in the stone building, they built a big, beautiful stone building. I love stone buildings, by the way to protect Sequoia's house. And that's what we're gonna go inside and see. So this in front of me is Sequoia's cabin. This is now a historical site on the National Registry. Look at that. It's amazing to me how people built these log cabins in clay. And then over here they have a statement from the act of union between the Eastern and Western Cherokees. And I don't know if it'll show up on the film because of the lights, so I'll read it to you. It says, we the people composing the Eastern and Western Cherokee Nation in National Convention Assembly by virtue of our original and unalienable rights to hereby solemnly and mutually agree to form ourselves into one body politic under the style and title of the Cherokee Nation. Excerpt from the Act of Union between the Eastern and Western Cherokees signed on July 12th, 1839. And that's where this became the Cherokee Nation. And I'm actually gonna go up there either later today or tomorrow, depending on the time, because I think it's like two o'clock. This is a quilt from back then and some pieces of fabric. And look at this artwork. That's beautiful stitch work. And then over here, this shows, it says the state of Sequoia right there. And it shows the Indian territories. Map compiled of United States Geological Survey, map of Indian territory, edited edition of July, 1902, revised, revisioned to date. here's the other side of his cabin. There's like the water buckets you hang on oxen. I've actually seen that once in my life. And then there's some sort of tool to cut either the thick grass or wood and some gourds. I don't know what they used those gourds for back then. I'll have to learn that. And then here's for grinding corn or any other kind of wheat or vegetable. And this must be the back door. Those are the brick steps. Door. Here's the things for two oxen to pull a cart. And then that is a cradle scythe implement used for mowing and reaping. Yeah, could you imagine how they mowed back then with all that thick grass? Here's some baskets and pottery. Wait till you see this big thing that he used to collect salt in. And then up here, this says, in our tribe's long and storied history, Sequoia made an everlasting impact and truly changed the way our people communicated, shared ideas, and preserved history. He was a genius who advanced the Cherokee nation and our rich culture. He reshaped the future of Cherokees and all native people, not just seven generations, but infinite generations. Principal Chief Bill John Baker during Cherokee Nation's acquisition of Sequoia's cabin in 2016. So this is recent where they took over his cabin and built this. And look at this, this is an external fireplace. 
I wonder if in the winter they still cooked outside. Sorry, I tripped over a rock, guys. Then over here, more tools that I don't know how to explain. That's definitely a saw that you sawed trees with. But this thing, this long wooden thing into this tree trunk, I don't know what that is. Maybe to churn, it looks like it would churn butter, but I don't know. But look at this cabin. Pretty dang amazing. The present generations have already experienced the great benefit of your incomparable system. The old and the youth find no difficulty in learning to read and write in their native language. Types have been made and a printing press established in this nation. Whilst posterity continues to be benefited by the discovery, your name will exist in grateful remembrance. From a letter addressed to Sequoia from John Ross dated January 12, 1832. And here's the typeset of the Sequoia Cherokee Symbolary. Look at that. That's pretty dang amazing. Sounds represented by vowels. Constant sounds. Here's about the development. And again, I'm not going to record it all because I do think people need to come here and see this, whether you're Native American or not, this is part of American history. And here's inside his cabin, which I think is super cool, but it does have upstairs that they don't let you go in. That's just gonna look dark, but it's a ladder going into a loft. And then here's an internal fireplace. And on the other side of it is the external one I showed you. A little old chair, a table and a stool. A bed, one of those wheels for making their blankets and stuff, the spinning wheel. And then there's the desk where he wrote the first symbols. But this is beautiful. There's furs hanging on the wall. But it actually is like warm and cozy in here. And I know they have heat in this building. And I'm sure back then it was heated by fire. But I still think it's cool that it's warm and cozy. There's a picture of what he's presumed to have looked like. It has been 14 years since we who are called Cherokee have learned to read. I am thankful that the people have slowly understood how much labor it has cost me. From an undated letter signed by Sequoia. More tools. So here's this bowl I had mentioned earlier. This is a giant iron kettle. So about 10 miles from here, he had like a salt spring that he used to go down and work for a couple months every year. And he used to trade, from what they understand, he used to trade his salt for firewood so he could burn the water, boil the water down to make more salt. Over here they have a water tower. I'm not sure if this is from back then or new because I don't think they had water towers back then. Because, you know, they're talking about the early 1800s in there. I know they, you know, obviously had ways of collecting water in springs, but usually it was done by buckets. But I'm wondering if at a later date, this water tower was used to collect water and that that is one of those tornado or hurricane sheds that people hide in. But we will read this and figure it out. A windmill pumped well water into a wooden holding tank atop this stone structure. This provided gravity flow water to all buildings on this site during the 1930s through the 1950s. That is pretty cool. I don't think you can go in the water tank. No. Nope, it doesn't open. It looked like it did. That's the only reason I tried. So don't want anybody to get me in any trouble. Water tower. Look at that old door though. And I don't know what this little building over here is. It doesn't have any sign or anything, but you could definitely tell it's old. It does have electricity going to it and benches, but this facility was only built in 2016, protecting everything. This is the freshwater spring on the property and they have a, a rock wall and then it fenced off so I don't think you can get any closer to it 
to see and I can't tell if there's water in there. I don't hear anything bubbling up. And I do see water with stuff floating on it. So I don't know how fresh it is anymore. But they do have a cool observation bridge going up to it. See, and then it's over there. And then they have this over here, which does look like a well house. So I don't know if they're pumping it or what, but nothing says. But they have a really nice picnic area out here. If anybody wanted to drive all the way out here and have a picnic. And over there, they're just burning some winter debris from cleaning up their leaves. But I wanted to show you this tree. Check out this tree. It actually looks like steps grew in it. It's pretty cool. I hope this stabilizer is working. Looks like you can climb steps of the tree to get up there. That's pretty cool. Building on their property is used as the administrative building and entrance. And then they built restrooms out of the blocks. Pretty, pretty, pretty place. Well, I am at the Cherokee National Museum. And this is now the head of the Cherokee Nation. They don't let me take any pictures or record inside the museum, which was great. So you do have to go visit it. But I can record this little village outside. So this is a rural village on the capital of the Cherokee Nation, from what I understand they're telling me. And I haven't gone inside to look at anything yet, so we'll both be doing this for the first time. Oh, look at that old cradle. Little chairs. That is my Cherokee name, John Ketcher. The Cherokees adopted the spinning wheel and harness loom in 1790. Spinning wheel well over here. They produced intricately designed coverlets, creating an income that surpassed the leather trade. This two room house, board and fashion exterior, was common in simple homes of the early days. And the years might pass before interior plaster was applied. Heating by fireplace before damage were used was not efficient, making cast iron stoves more desirable. Fireplace openings might be that old bed. First building we went through was the Weaver's house, and now we're going into the New Hope Church. And look, you can still see that the logs and the clay were maintained. It's amazing how they are able to keep this stuff up. Oh, Jesus. After moving to Indian Territory, Cherokee Nation set aside one acre of ground for each church congregation. Moravians, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians were among the first to devote missionary efforts to Cherokee communities. The earliest missions offered schools, which made them very attractive to Cherokee leaders. Here's a log cabin. I think it's neat that every time you go into each one, something plays first in Cherokee and then in English. Still, when Cherokee residents first moved to Indian Territory in the 1820s, there were numerous trees needed to be quickly cleaned to make fields or gardens. If a stacked wood chimney was used, it had to be lined with mud, clay, or with grass or straw to make it fireproof. This cabin represented a tradition bound family. Now we're at the general store. <laughs> There's a sign that says gone fishing on it. There's the post office. That's pretty cool. Wanted posters. A rocking chair. Playing checkers. People did used to hang out in the general stores. There's actually a little town in Arizona um, up by Camp Verde where they still do. I actually went in there once to buy something just on a road trip. And they were hanging out, playing cards, having a few drinks, just chatting away. I thought that was cool. This one is a quilter's home. Inside the museum, they have a gift shop 
and they have quilts that were made by Cherokee Indians. They also have Afghans in there, but they're really, really pricey. Oh, my mom has one of these. Oh. As the wife of a Cherokee merchant, I would keep busy with many household chores. The most time-consuming chore was sewing because travel sewing machines worked without electricity. Tear dresses, made in the earlier days, gave way in the 1890s to the slim skirt and largely blouse or jacket worn by those who cared to be fashionable. However, in our rural area, gingham dresses could still be found, along with a hunter's jacket made of a durable fabric. As merchants, our household automatically received discounts and were the first with the opportunity to buy new things. My children grew up working in the business. Our sleeping, cooking, baking. And the last building to tour, the schoolhouse. So anyway, when you first pull up on this place, you see the three uh, smokestacks from when this was a Cherokee Women's Seminary. Now, like I said, it became the head of the Cherokee Nation. I'm going to be quiet while the recording goes on because I know it's going to say something. Oh, so that's the one building where it does it. It's amazing to me how small all these buildings were. Oh, look at that, the little chalkboards they wrote on. Well, this one didn't play any music. I mean, didn't play any sayings or anything. Oh. Huh. Pretty cool. Anyway, so when you pull up to this place, you see three smokestacks outside. That's what's left over of the first Cherokee Women's Seminary. And then there, it tells a story about that one and the second one. Then you go through the museum, and it talks about Will Rogers, who was a Cherokee child and also a famous screen cowboy. And then it goes on to talk about the Trail of Tears, which I've talked about several times, so I probably shouldn't bring that up again. And then outside here is an urban village, and then they have a historical village. Here's the urban village, which is already closed for the day, so I don't get to go see that. So there, so if you ever come here, you can record the historical village and show it to me. But today I went and saw Sequoia's house. That is the guy who wrote the Cherokee language. And now I saw the head of the Cherokee Nation. I am off to Oklahoma City tomorrow. Here's another plaque that explains the Trail of Tears. Bye.